Shalom, Shalom. Hag Sameach and welcome to Bet Ariel Passover presentation. It's my prayer that we'll all be blessed as we travel. We will travel back in history and, so, and see all that Jesus has done and is doing for us and how great is his love for us and for the whole world. You know, times of Passover represent for me a time filled with nostalgia. It, it brings me back to my youth in Morocco, Casablanca, Morocco, where I remember these long and lively family Passover suppers that lasted until the early hours of the day. Each year at Passover and for last, the last 3,500 years, Jews gather to celebrate this feast as God has ordered them to do. And by tradition, they have kept a certain order, a certain way of doing it. And this order we will follow today, you know, this order actually that we'll follow will date, dates back to the time of Yeshua as it transcends time and distances. For instance, Sephardic Jews, Jews who come from Arabic and Spanish countries, and Ashkenazi Jews who have lived in European countries, have for the most part kept the same order in retelling the story of Passover. Quite fascinating, uh, considering that these two groups seldom crossed paths for the last 2,000 years, that is, since the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. I remember as a Sephardic Jew being invited to my Ashkenazi wife's house for Shabbat and for the feast of Passover for the traditional Seder, how surprised I, wa I was and how this feast were conducted in the same way that we did in Morocco with the same, sometimes the same uh, melodies and so on, which shows to us that this tradition, as we will do today, goes back to the time of Yeshua. And so we will see how it was done then. And the Feast of Passover takes a great place in the scriptures, not only for Israel, but for all believers in Yeshua today, Jews and Gentiles. Concerning Israel, Passover represents the first of the seven feasts of the Lord that is connected with the creation of the nation of Israel. This feast really begins the history of Israel as a nation. And the fact that it is the first feast of the Jewish, in the Jewish calendar in the scriptures, falling out in the first month of the calendar, Nisan, it means that we have now begun a new year. It is the only new year that we have in the scriptures. So it is fitting with, to wish each other Happy New Year. So, Happy New Year to you. And as we walk through the Passover together, we will dis rediscover and discover some important elements that have been lost in today's modern Judaism. Elements such as the lamb, the lamb itself, its blood, and how it protected the Israelites from their sins or from the judgment. And throughout the biblical history of Israel, the Jewish people are often, very often, reminded of this great feast, for it is mentioned some 120 times after the Exodus in the scriptures. So the reader is often drawn back to the Passover, especially to remember how the Lord saved the Jewish people. That is, through the Lamb. The Lamb, this is the main theme of Passover. But it doesn't stop here. It is also very often mentioned and referred to in the New Testament some 27 times. Concerning the relationship of the Passover with the church, its ties with, with the Passover are as strong as it is with Israel. Its great importance could be seen in that we find in the Passover the origin of one of the two ordinances that were given to the church. That is the breaking of the bread. This breaking of the bread that we do in our congregations takes its origin at the Passover Seder. We read in 1 Corinthians 11.24 when Paul instituted the breaking of the bread, saying, For as often as you eat this bread, bread that is, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Passover directs us to rediscover this vital connection. And by studying the Passover, we'll be able to throw light on many passages that we have in the New Testament. For example, when John the Baptist saw Yeshua approaching, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was from a Levite family. 
The Levites was the, that tribe who took care of the temple sacrifices. And when Yohanan, that is John, pointed to Yeshua, he was not referring to the many lambs that were sacrificed daily at the temple. But he was referring to the unique lamb that is the Passover lamb itself. John associated the Messiah with the sacrificial lamb that is off offered at Passover. Another passage which brings to mind the same association comes from a man who was a Pharisee and was also quite familiar with temple sacrifices. This passage comes from Paul's hand when in 1 Corinthians 5-7 he writes, For indeed the Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And so like John the Baptist, Rabbi Shaul or Paul identified the Messiah with a Paschal Lamb. Uh, up, by the way, to the book of Revelation, where Jesus is called the Lamb. Do you know how many times? 28 times, always bringing back the events of Passover itself. So the Passover reaches deep into the faith of the believer. It is a major element of the foundation of our faith. And it correlates the Paschal Lamb, of course, with Jesus, that is Yeshua. What we will see, and this is at the core of the message of Passover, is how the blood of the Lamb covered the Israelites and protected them from judgment in the same way how today the Messiah Yeshua, who is the Lamb of God, protects whoever had made Yeshua the personal Savior. Now before we go on, as it is our tradition, let us first bless our children. If you have your children next to you, put your hands upon them or think about them. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Yachad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchut Olam Vaed. Blessed be his name whose glorious kingdom is coming and is forever and ever. Avinu Malkenu, we as one body lift up our children to your throne and pray for great blessings and protection for each one of them. Heavenly Father, we lift them up to you so that you put your hand upon them all the time. May our sons and daughters walk after you and fear you and keep your word and obey your voice. All this we pray in the name of the one sitting at your right hand, Yeshua Mashiach. Let us now follow the ancient tradition to bless the word before we open it. You can say it with me. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gives the scriptures. Amen and amen. Let's now go to the Passover, back to the Passover, and consider one, again, important aspect before we proceed with the demonstration. What does this feast represent? What is the message behind it? Before the last plague and before the Israelites left Egypt, God told them to take a lamb, to sacrifice it and put the blood on the lintel of the door and the two doorposts, just like you have it in the picture on the screen. What is interesting is to see how God asked them to place the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts. Why this matter? If you draw a line joining the three points, you have a well-known ancient Jewish sign associated with redemption and which became to be known as the cross. It is the ancient way to write the letter Tav in Hebrew, as you have it again on the door. Where do we see this sign of redemption in the history of the Bible? Let me bring you to one important passage, that is the passage of Ezekiel. Just before Jer Jerusalem was destroyed, God gave an important instruction. In Ezekiel 9.4, he says, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the forehead of the man who sight and cry over the abomination that are done within it. And then whoever had the tav, the tav on their forehead, was they were saved. The Hebrew word for mark here in Ezekiel is tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet written in the form of a cross, reminding the Israelites at the time of Ezekiel of the same sign that were, they were asked to make on their doorposts. So the letter Tav and the T-cross would impress them as the sign of God's redemptive 
work. Later, David recalled this sign in his prophecy of the crucifixion of the Messiah in the crucifixion chapter of the scriptures, which is Psalm 22. And there he said, they pierced my hands and my feet. Here we see the meaning of this feast, the Passover lamb whose blood was applied in this particular manner represents the Messiah. And again, as its blood protected the Israelites, so the blood of the Messiah protects you if you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. This is what Passover is all about. It is about salvation that we find in the Jewish Messiah. We remember what Isaiah 53, 7 says. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a what? A lamb. A lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah, like John the Baptist, like Paul, understood the connection between the Passover lamb and the Messiah. Isaiah directly calls the Messiah the lamb. That the Messiah is the lamb of God was recognized by many ancient rabbis. The Targum of Isaiah, which must have been written before Yeshua came on earth, begins with a section by saying, Behold my servant, the Messiah. It's not a new thing in Judaism. Now let us go back to the Exodus. What then happened that night in Egypt from which event the Passover was instituted? That night, as the destroyer came at the 10th plague, the last plague, he passed through the land of Egypt, and when he came to, to a home, and when he saw the blood upon the lintel again and the doorpost, he would again pass over the home. This is where the name of the feast Passover originates, the passing over of the Jewish homes by the angel of death. The word actually also means to protect. It also means to shelter, as God does to whomever is covered by the tab. Now let's begin the demonstration proper, where we'll find more of these great riches that the Lord has left us in the scriptures and in history. And from there, we will see how Yeshua himself celebrated the Passover. Let's follow the order into which it is done. The first item is the lighting of the candle. Lighting of the candles. Now the Passover supper starts by lighting the candles. The first thing that came about over the darkness in Genesis 1 was light. Light. In the same way, light is the first item in the demonstration. And so the menorah is lit by a woman as Miriam or Mary brought light to this world. So a woman brings light into the table of the Passover. So for the Jewish believers, of course, the menorah, the light, reminds us of Yeshua, who's the light of the world. And so I'm going to ask my wife Sharon to come up and to do the blessings for us. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu Al Yidei HaMashiach, Yeshua Or HaOlam. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by the merits of Yeshua the Messiah, who is the light of the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sharon. Now the second item is the Haggadah. Haggadah, this is, this is what I have here. Uh, this book contains the prayers and the history of the Exodus with many commentaries. This book is read during the night of the Passover. The reading of this book takes something like two to three hours as it is read by different members of the family and also after the supper. I've personally kept very fond memories of these Passover nights in my childhood. My father loved to read some passages in three different languages, Hebrew, Spanish, and French. And so, and so instead of two to three hours, it was three to four hours. And my mother was not happy because the soup was getting cold and it was the same story every year. 
So Haggadah in Hebrew means, and you shall tell. This is taken from Exodus chapter 13, verse 8. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. Not for us, for me, because it's a personal salvation that when we encounter the Lord. And today you can find some 1,200 different versions of Haggadah. Why so many versions for just one story? Of course, you remember the story, the, the saying, two Jews, three opinions. So the history of Israel is a beautiful tapestry of engaging opinions. And we can see this right at the birth of the story of Exodus, right? They were constantly arguing with poor Moses. Everyone had their own opinion. But besides this 1200 version, we have also the Messianic versions. This, you know, where it explains, of course, the correlation between the New Testament and the Exodus. Let's take a closer look at the other items on the table. On the table, there will always be a specially designed plate known as the Seder plate. This plate has six indentations, in, into which of the six indentations, they have a special type of food or herb that is placed. You have the celery, the bitter herbs, the, the roasted egg, the lamb's bones, the haduset, of course, the matzah. What is the significance of these items? I'll be explaining each one as we go through the Passover that Yeshua actually went through. And so with these items, we have two cups of wine, this one and this one. Two cups of wine. Uh, why two of them? The first one is drunk four times during the ceremony. The other is filled, but it's not touched. It's not drunk. Let, let's take a look at the first one. During the Passover meal, there are four blessings over the wine. The Passover meal is structured, actually, around its cups of wine. Every Jew was required to drink four cups of wine to fulfill the Passover. And you can imagine how loud it is towards the end of the supper, singing and arguing, and so on. So this is when the Passover reaches the New Testament. Three of these cups are mentioned in the Gospel, the first, the third, and the fourth. The first cup is called the cup of blessing. This cup starts the Passover supper. It is mentioned in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 18, at the Last Supper. This is what it says, and when the hour had come, he, Yeshua, sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them with fervent desire, I, I, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Here Yeshua starts the Passover meal with a kiddush. It was the first cup, but also the last cup of wine that Jesus actually would drink. And why didn't Yeshua drink the other cups of wine? Here he says that the next time he will drink the Kiddush will be with the believers with us, that is, when we meet with him. That would be during the wedding supper of the Lamb that is coming when we reach uh, heaven. And so Yeshua anticipated our gathering together with him. And today he's preparing a great feast for us, a reunion supper for all believers that we'll have with him when we'll all be gathered together up there. And I want to tell you, if the believer today longs to meet the Lord, the Lord longs and years for this time even more as he keeps his best wine for this occasion. Furthermore, it is written that Yeshua and the apostle reclined on the table. The tradition says that during the Passover night, we should drink the wine reclining on the left side. This left side symbolizing freedom. Freedom from slavery. This is for us the freedom we have in God through, of course, the Messiah. The second cup is called the cup of redemption and is referred to as the cup of the Haggadah. That is of the retelling of the story of Exodus. It is after this cup that the story of Exodus is told. This cup actually is not mentioned in the gospel. The third one, the third cup is called the cup of the resurrection and symbolizes the physical resurrection of Israel at the Exodus. This cup is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, 
chapter 22, verse 20, which situates it at the end of the meal. And there we read, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. It is at this third cup of wine that we see the origin of the wine of the ceremony, of the breaking of the bread, the communion that we do today in our congregations and churches. Here we see the strong relationship between Israel and the scriptures. The Jews are intrinsically connected with the word and also with each believer. Later, Paul refers to this cup and institutes the communion. The fourth cup is called the cup of salvation because at the end of the meal, psalms of salvation are read. These are the Hallel. The Hallel are, are the Psalm 113 to 118. And these speak of the salvation one has through the Messiah, especially the last part of this section speaks of the salvation brought by the Messiah himself. And the very last passage speaks of the rejection of the Messiah. Psalm 118.22 says, The stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It is believed to be the Hallel, by the way, that Yeshua and the disciples sang as they were going out towards the Mount of Olives, as we read in Matthew 26, 20, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, which is Matthew 24. This is right before he was delivered to be crucified. And every year, every Jewish family ends the supper with Psalm 118, as if the Lord is calling to each one of them to help them to make that connection between the sacrificial lamb whose blood saved their ancestors and Yeshua himself, who today saves us. But there's another cup besides the fourth, that is the fifth cup, which would usually stand there until the end. What does this cup represent? I'll tell you later. Let's keep on. But let's, I want to do the buracha on the wine, that is the, the blessings. It goes, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam boreh peri hagefen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Amen. After the blessing of the first cup of wine, we have the urkats. The urkats, which literally means to wash, to wash, because at this point there's a washing of the hands. During the temple time, this ceremony was done for the removing of ritual impurities. However, since there is no temple today, the washing of the hands is a reminder of the procedure that was done during the temple period and also expresses the hope that the Jews will soon be obligated to do this ceremony once again with the hope also that is especially of building the third temple as it is in the Jewish prayer, daily prayers. This ceremony, by the way, is found in John 13 and it is very touching. The normal procedure is that the hands are washed by a servant, by a slave. On this occasion, Yeshua broke with the Jewish custom in that he took the servant's role by doing the role, by, by washing not on the hands of the disciples, but what did he wash? The feet of the disciples. We read in John 13, verses 5, 3 to 5, listen to these words here. He says, Yeshua, knowing that the Father has given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garment, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. You know, this is through this ceremony that Yeshua gave us an example of the spirit of servanthood, something all believers are called to demonstrate. At the time, it was again only the slaves, only the servant who washed the feet of the guest. But here Yeshua took the place of a servant, teaching the disciples that all believers, that we ought to serve each other, of course, with humility. Jesus put in practice what he previously said, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Mark 9.35. Here, the Messiah who comes from above, and who has all powers stoop down to wash the disciples' feet. This is a beautiful and great example we have here. 
And on this table, we find another very important item, the shank of the bone. That is the bone, the shank bone of the lamb. After the destruction of the temple, the eating of roasted lamb was prohibited on Passover night. And since it cannot be served as a remembrance of the temple's destruction, a shank of a lamb was placed on the table. And so tradition says that they would eat the lamb actually very slowly. In order, that is the time of the temple. Very slowly in order not to break a bone. Others say that they should eat it eat before even touching the lamb or eating the lamb. So that they wouldn't be too hungry and go too fast and break a bone. So that they would not break it of course. So tradition also says that the shank bone should be from the forearm of the lamb. Because it was with an outstretched arm that God brought the Jews out of the land of Egypt in Deuteronomy 26.8. Now, here's a very powerful, powerful correlation made between the Paschal Lamb that was sacrificed on Passover and the crucifixion of the Messiah. Let's remember that according to biblical practices, the Lamb was to be set aside on the 10th day of the month, of Nisan, of the first month. And so from the 10th until the 14th day of the month, the lamb was to be tested to be sure that it was without spot, that it was without blemish, that it was good enough to be offered to God. So they had to keep it at home for four days to make sure that it was fit for sacrifice. Jesus was set aside on the 10th day of the month at the time of the triumphal entry. This is when he entered Jerusalem. The purpose of the triumphal entry was to set aside the Lamb of God as the Jewish people set aside a Lamb. And for four days, both the Messiah and the Lamb were tasted, tested, that is. Yeshua was tested by the religious and civil authorities. He was tested by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the Herodians. They could not find one fault with the Messiah. Even Pilate and Herod could not find anything wrong with Yeshua. Yeshua was qualified to be the final sacrifice, Passover sacrifice. Then on the 14th of the month of Nisan, Jesus was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning. And it was at 9 o'clock in the morning when the first lamb was offered at the temple compound. And he stayed on the cross until the second lamb was sacrificed, until 3 p.m. And then he gave up his spirit, thus fulfilling the Passover for us. And furthermore, as the Israelites were very careful to make sure that not a single bone of the Passover lamb was broken, as we read in John 19.36, it points out that not a single bone of Yeshua also was broken. Not at all. And so this was completely fulfilled. Yeshua, Jesus, was the final sacrifice that is lamb. See that Passover is much more than matzah and horseradish, right? It's about the lamb of God. It's about salvation. It's about eternity. And when one considers the many lambs Jewish families were to keep at home for four days to make sure that it had no blemish at all, the message is even more enhanced. Four days at home is enough to get attached to an innocent animal, especially a lamb. After four days, surely the children would say, why kill an innocent animal? But we ask the same question, why did Jesus have to die, him who was completely innocent? Let's look into the ceremony of the carpus, which follows the washing of the hand. This is when the celery is dipped into salt water. This is what they do. In Hebrew word, carpus designates any kind of vegetable, and it became custom to use parsley or celery. Why celery? It is a symbol of the hyssop, which was dipped into the blood and applied on the lintel and the door posts. And why salt water? This is a reminder that when Israel was a young nation, God saved her by means of salt waters of the Red Sea. And salt water also reminds us of the tears that they shed because of their suffering. This ceremony, by the way, is in the gospel. This ceremony is mentioned in Matthew 26 and also in Mark chapter 14. One incident happened during this ceremony which will again show us how God's deep love and great patience is 
for every single man. It is during this ceremony that Yeshua announced that one of the 12 disciples was about to betray him. And so we read Matthew 26, to the 20, that is 20 to 23, says, When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I said to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dips his hand with me in the dish will betray me. And it was at this time that Yeshua took the celery and dipped it into salt water. And it was at this time that Judas Iscariot also dipped his parsley into the bowl. Now let me tell you about the great miracle here. Because there's a miracle which happened at this very moment. One that is often overlooked. But I love to remember this every single year. This is the first of two times when Yeshua gave a clear indication that Judas Iscariot was to betray him. He clearly said that the one who dips his, his, that is celery into the water will be the one. But question we ask, if he said it so clearly, why didn't the 11 disciples realize what was going on? Even though everything was done in the open, they did not catch on. I truly believe that the reason is that by the grace of God, it was hidden from them. If they had found out that Judas was going to betray Jesus, their reaction, and especially that of Peter perhaps, would have had you know, Judas Iscariot tied to a chair. He would have jeopardized actually the going of Yeshua into the cross. If the disciple again understood what was going on, they would have no doubt attempted to prevent Judas Iscariot. And, and the reader would have no problem identifying Judas Iscariot, for we were given many indication in the gospel about the condition of his heart. However, you know that for three years, that the disciples were with Jesus, at no time did they suspect that Judas Iscariot was not a true believer. Especially because I believe that Yeshua spread his love equally to the twelve. thus giving ample time for Judas Iscariot to repent. This is who Jesus is. This is who Yeshua is. He is love personified. This is the love we ought, of course, to imitate toward others. This is how the blessing goes. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruits of the earth. Amen. After the carpus comes another very, very powerful ceremony. The breaking of the middle matzah that we call the afikomen which this ceremony we can call the mystery of Passover, at least as modern Judaism is concerned. What is the meaning of the ritual and why do the Jews do it today? The Afikomen. Okay, the custom is known as Tzafun Baruch. Tzafun means hidden. It is the, this is the blessing, the Tzafun, but what or who is hidden? Let me first tell you how the ceremony is done, year after year. Here, in my bag, there are three matzahs. Can't find the first one, but it's there. <laughs> it's, okay, so we take the middle matzah, break it in half, put it in a linen cloth, and hide it. At the third cup, remember the third cup, it's taken out and peace is given to everyone, to every one of them. Why this, how is this by the way is clay, uh, explained in Judaism and what is the origin of this ceremony? For instance, some Jewish commentators say that it represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the Levites, the, the priests, and Israel. However, I want to tell you, you take all these theories, none of them explain well why that is the middle matzah is taken out, broken, hidden until the third cup, and then distributed to others. Modern Judaism, rabbinical Judaism, has a hard time explaining the presence of the three matzah 
and why again the middle one is broken. How then can we find the reason behind it? Let's consider the word afikomen, because this is what it's called. The word is not a Hebrew word, but a Greek word. This indicates that it was a newly instituted ceremony, at least at around the first century. This word afikomen is made up of two words, epi and komen. Komen is from the root komos, which means a great feast. And epi means because of. And so epikomen literally would mean because or leading to this great feast. But which feast is it? It must be the great feast of the, the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures spoke about when we will meet the Messiah himself. Yeshua himself made a relation with this feast when after distributing the bread, he took and raised the fourth cup of wine and said, I will not drink of this wine, of the, the, this wine that is from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the feast he must have referred to. He did not drink it because he decided to wait until we will all be gathered together again to enjoy together this future great feast, which is the marriage of the Lamb. And today many believe that this part of the ceremony was instituted by believers in Yeshua. At this time, the, the, these new Messianic Jews, these new Christians, were still going to different synagogues and were part of the main stream of Judaism. Perhaps they brought about this ceremony and it stayed in the tradition. This will explain why, why the three matzah are here. And so the middle one is taken, broken, taken back after the third cup. It surely reminds us of the Messiah who was crucified and rose the third day. And the last meal, he took the same piece of matzah and he said, take, eat, this is my body. This is when he instituted, if you want, the breaking of bread. I, I, you know, I want to tell you, I find it extraordinary that this ceremony is done year after year in every Jewish home, yet most do not know that the afikomen first is a Greek word. None can explain why the middle matzah is broken and taken out of the third cup. Once again, God leaves these elements, I believe, and bids them to ask, seek, inquire. Let's look at the matzah itself. I know you have a bag. You can pull out your matza from the bag. I want to tell you that this matza reminds us so much of the Messiah Yeshua. If you don't have your bag, I know there are some in the, in the foyer in the back. First question is, why is the matza unleavened? As we have seen before, the leaven symbolizes sin. So the unleavened bread symbolizes the body of the Messiah. For the making of the matzah, it is done under extraordinary rigid laws. During this time, the dough is under continuous manipulation in order not to have fermentation. A further precaution is to pierce it in order for air bubbles to escape. So we need to see the light through the matza for the matza to be kosher. Furthermore, it is lined for the same reason. In fact, if any of these elements are missing, unleavened bread, unleavened that is lined or pierced, it is disqualified for Passover. Now the fact that the matza had to be pierced and lined reminds us of the important messianic verse that we have in the scriptures. Concerning the piercing, we have one extraordinary verse, Zechariah 12.10, and they will look upon me, whom they have pierced, right? When the Messiah comes back, they will look upon me, who they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. The verse explained the second coming when Yeshua will come, they will recognize him and they will look on him. Whom they have pierced. Who is the me, by the way, in this verse? It is God who is speaking. He is the one who will pour out on the remnant of the Jewish people a spirit of grace and supplication so they can see Yeshua. But if it is God who is speaking here, who then is the Him for whom the people of Israel and the nation of the world as well are going to mourn because they're going to recognize who Yeshua is at the end. This is the Messiah himself, Yeshua Mashiach, the son of David. 
And concerning the lines, remember that powerful chapter of Isaiah 53, one verse, and he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisements of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. It is as if God took took any possible opportunity to challenge his people to always think about the Messiah. And it is with this 11 bread that Paul instituted the second element of the Lord's Supper. Let's proceed with the blessing and then you can eat your matzah. Uh, let's do the blessing in Hebrew. I'll do it first and then you. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu mel ha'olam asher kitshanu bemizvotam vetsivanu hakilat matzah. Your turn. Okay, I'll do it slowly. <laughs> you can say it after me. Baruch atah Adonai. Eloheinu melech ha'olam Asher kitshanu Bemizvota Vetsivanu Hakilat Matza Blessed are thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has brought us to celebrate the life of Yeshua as we eat this matza. Amen. You may eat it if you want. After this, in the Seder, the worshipper is led to the ten plagues. That's very interesting, the ten plagues. At this point, the master of the house says, they are, these are the ten plagues, which the most holy, blessed be he, brought on the Egyptian in Egypt. And he mentioned each of these plagues. The whole family is asked to pour one drop of wine from their cup with a spoon or with their fingers while saying together each, mentioning each of the ten plagues. What is the meaning of this ceremony about remembering the ten plagues? The aim is to remember the sovereignty and the power of God. Because each of these ten plagues represents an Egyptian god. And each is put down showing the supremacy of the god of the scriptures. Amen? And there is some irony in this story, by the way. The first of the ten plagues called down by Moses to change the water of the Nile into blood. What did Pharaoh professional magicians do? Instead of turning the blood back into water, they proudly displayed their art of doing the same thing by their spells. So they turned the little water left in, in Egypt into blood. So they made the plague worse for the Egyptians instead of helping them. This is the irony, if you want, of the... Uh, message there. Now the next ceremony is one that reminds the people of Israel of the harsh treatment they endured at the birth of the nation. During this ceremony the horseradish is spread on a piece of matzah just like you have in the picture. Why would the Jews do that? The horseradish or maror by, by, by its bitter taste is a reminder of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. As it is written, they embittered our lives with mortar and bricks. Exodus 1.14. Here again, in this ceremony, we remember through it the suffering of the Israelites since the last diaspora in 70 AD. Things that were prophesied by Moses, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. And also we remember the suffering of the Messiah for us. This is how the blessing goes before they eat it. Eating the bitter herbs with the haruset is the next ceremony. So what they do is that they put the maror and they mix it with something very sweet. This ceremony consists again of putting the two together. Uh, what is the haruset itself? There's no English equivalent to translate the word haruset. It is a combination of chopped apples, nuts, either walnuts or almonds, honey, cinnamon, wine. So every one would have to mix them together and eat it. But what is the significance of this feast? It's to remember two things. The salvation they have in Yeshua by the sweet taste. And also the bitter taste. The bitter taste to remember their, their, their suffering. So we have salvation and suffering in there. So this ceremony, by the way, is seen in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 21 to 30, where Jesus identified for the second time the one who will betray him. Here again, he does not mention the name of the one who will betray him, but he gives an indication. 
The Jerusalem Talmud, by the way, maintains that the Haruset was much more liquid at that time, like which help us to understand better the passage of John 13, 26. When after that, we ask him, he, he asked who will betray him. Jesus answered, as it is written, it is he with whom he shall give a piece of bread, and I have dipped it, right? And have dipped the bread. He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. It is at this time that Judas Iscariot got up from the table, and he went to betray Yeshua. The prayer goes like this, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melchalam Bore Peri Ha'adama. At the Passover table, there's also an egg. The egg, you know, just, by the way, they would be eaten just before the meal and in salt water. So the roasted egg represents the sacrifice which, has, which was offered in the temple in the first morning of the Passover. There are several meanings given to this as well. The roundness of the egg symbolizes the cycle of life. It is a symbol of mourning over the destruction of the temple when the paschal sacrifices ceased. Also, the fact that there's an egg in place of the lamb makes it a sign, of course, of mourning. So the egg is, by the way, a symbol also of the resurrection in Judaism. And perhaps that is the origin of connecting Christ's resurrection with Eastern eggs. So some of you, again, might have noticed at the end of the table, there's an empty chair and there's a glass of wine. What does this represent? It represents the cup of Elijah. Very important in Judaism. Most Jewish homes would have an empty, or that is an empty chair and a full cup in case Elijah decide to come on that very night. This tradition is based on the book of Malachi. Chapter 4, verse 5, where God promises the Jews that he will send Elijah the prophet before the second coming. Behold, it says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. According to this verse, Elijah must come before the Messiah to prepare the way for the Messiah. And the Jewish tradition says that Elijah must come only on Passover evening. And in this, in case Elijah comes this Passover, they leave an empty chair and a full cup of wine. And year after year, Elijah does not come. And year after year, the Passover supper ends with the phrase, next year in Jerusalem. The reason behind this phrase is that if Elijah did not come this year, that means that the Messiah will neither come this year. And if the Messiah does not come, the Jews will not return to Jerusalem this year. This is why they hope that he will come next year and next year will be, all the Jews will be in Jerusalem. What do the believers in Yeshua say today? Not next year in Jerusalem, but tomorrow in the new Jerusalem, even perhaps tonight in the new Jerusalem, because Yeshua is coming at any time now and we can see what is happening in this world, amen? What is the message that we have in the Feast of Passover? Today, the same Lamb, who is the Messiah himself, can save anyone, anyone from the coming judgment. This is the message of Passover. As the Israelites believe in the Word of God, they applied the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts and lintel, and they were saved. And so today, God is asking us to believe in Yeshua. It says in John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But what does the word say about those who do not believe? See the rest of the verse. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. And so it's only natural that we ask God to put the blood of the Lamb upon us by recognizing that the Jewish Messiah is none else than Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua Mashiach. Let's bow our head in prayer. I will pray an inspired uh, prayer. By, uh, it's called the Amida. Uh, that, is, that is prayed three times a day daily by religious Jews. This prayer dates from the first century and was edited, by the way, by Gamaliel, who was Paul's teacher. He goes like this. Lord, consider our suffering and fight our cause and redeem us quickly for the sake of your name. 
for you are a powerful Redeemer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. Blow the great shofar for our freedom and lift up a banner to gather our exiles and gather us from the four corners of the earth. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gathers the banished of your people Israel and to Jerusalem your city return in compassion and dwell therein. Let the shoot of David, your servant, come and quickly. All this, Lord, we as believers pray in the name of the one sitting at your right hand. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord place his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen.